I greet you in the name of our risen Lord and Savior. Welcome to the virtual worship service for Massey's Chapel United Methodist Church in Durham, North Carolina on this first Sunday in spring, which is also in church time, the fifth Sunday in Lent. I am Reverend Cheryl Lawrence, the pastor here at Massey's Chapel, and I'm glad that you could join us today. As we begin our worship, we always light a candle or two to symbolize the fact that Jesus Christ is in our midst no matter when or where we gather as a church. So if you have a candle with you, I invite you to light it with me now. Hear now this reading of John 12, 31 to 33, and this is Jesus speaking. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. And this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Hear now this reading of Psalm 51, verses 1 to 3 and 10 to 12. This is called a Psalm of David when the prophet Nathan came to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgression and my sin is ever before me. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore, restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain in me a willing spirit. And this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Hear now this reading of 2 Samuel 11, 26 to 12, 13. And this is a good story about repentance for the fifth Sunday in Lent. Our reading today begins after King David has seen Bathsheba bathing on the roof, called for her, made her pregnant, and arranged to have her husband Uriah killed. When the wife of Uriah heard that her husband was dead, she made lamentation for him. When the mourning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord, and the Lord sent Nathan the prophet to David. He came to him and said to him, There were two men in a certain city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. He brought it up, and it grew up with him and with his children. It used to eat out of his meager fare and drink from his cup and lie in his bosom, and it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was loath to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the wayfarer who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared that for the guest who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. He said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. He shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Nathan said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I gave you your master's house and your master's wives, and I gave you the house of Israel and of Judah, and if that had been too little, I would have added as much again. Why have you despised the word of the Lord and done what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and has taken and have taken his wife as your wife, and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house, for you have despised me, and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, I will raise up trouble against you from within your own house. And David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. I have sinned against the Lord. What an extraordinary response when you think about it. I have sinned against the Lord is not the usual response we hear when someone stands accused of serious wrongdoing and David is guilty of several whoppers. Things began badly when David was where he should not have been. How many times might we have prevented some initial wrongdoing simply by being where we were supposed to be? King David did not go out into the field with his troops, as the Bible tells us in previous verses. It was, the Bible says, it was the spring of the year when kings go out to battle, and yet David remained in Jerusalem. He should have been with his soldiers, but he was at home at loose ends bored, perhaps. One afternoon, David walked on the palace roof and he spied a beautiful woman bathing on a nearby roof. Please don't picture a bathtub sitting out on a roof with a woman lounging in it. Bathsheba was doing religious rites of purification according to Jewish law by immersing herself in a communal pool used for that purpose. Even today, observant Jewish women of childbearing age ritually purify themselves once a month by immersing nude in a special pool of water. Rainwater was collected on the roof in a cistern for this purpose. Apparently, the roof of David's palace had a nice view of the women's ritual bath, and David took full advantage of that, probably not for the first time. Hmm. So King David saw the beautiful Bathsheba, inquired about her, and discovered that she was married to one of his own soldiers. Despite this, he sent for her and took her, as the Bible says, and afterwards sent her home. Case closed, right? 
But no, things began to spin out of control almost immediately when Bathsheba got pregnant. So David sent a message to the battlefield calling home Bathsheba's husband, Uriah. So Uriah was commanded to come back to Jerusalem and David tried mightily to get Uriah to go home and to sleep with his wife so that no one would be the wiser about who was the baby's father. But Uriah refused to enjoy himself while his comrades were out fighting. He would not go home. When King David failed to entice Uriah to go home to Bathsheba, he then sent Uriah to the front lines and arranged for him to be killed by the enemy. Our scripture reading today begins as Bathsheba mourned the death of her husband and David took the widow to be his wife. And at this point, David's cover-up seemed to be working. With Uriah dead, no one would be the wiser. No one would know anything except God. (laughs) Except God. Our sins are never really a secret, are they? The thing that David had done displeased the Lord, the Bible says, and God sent the prophet Nathan to confront the king. Well, what a dangerous thing to do to confront a king with the incendiary statement, you are the man, not to mention having to deliver the rest of the prophecy about the sword never departing from David's house. It's dangerous business confronting people in power. So instead of arriving at the palace and screaming an accusation at a king who might not be ready to hear it, Nathan first told a little parable about a lamb and its owner. What a great story to tell a king who used to be a shepherd. David predictably was filled with righteous anger over the lamb and now was ready to receive the startling verdict. You are the man. Still, King David's first response might have been to cut off the prophet's head. It's not so uncommon for prophets to lose their heads, right? Remember John the Baptist? Our first human response to the accusation of serious sin often is the desire to silence the person who confronts us. Now, we might not actually have to kill them, We might not need to. Sometimes just a threat or an implied threat is enough to keep the accuser silent. And think about this. Sometimes abuse goes on for years by people in power while witnesses look the other way over fear of retribution. But King David did not kill or threaten the prophet. Instead, he said, I have sinned against the Lord. We begin to see why David was a man after God's own heart, as the Bible says. When Nathan confronted David, the king might have responded by denying the charges. He might have said, I am not the man. I don't know what you're talking about. One of the ways that we deal with getting caught is denial. But David did not deny what he had done. He admitted, I have sinned against the Lord. King David might have tried to blame Bathsheba and cast himself as a victim. How typical would that be? David might have said, well, Bathsheba was bathing nude on the roof in full view of the palace, and I am a red-blooded male. If women insist on bathing on the roof, what do they expect? But he didn't. Leaders, whether they are kings, presidents, generals, bosses, teachers, pastors, whatever, leaders bear the responsibility for protecting boundaries, of using restraint and exercising moral behavior, not because the leaders are better people, but because they have more power. David's sins were fundamentally abuses of power. Abuse of power is a sin. What else might David have said that he did not? The king might have said, Oh, come on, Nathan, everyone does it. I didn't do anything that other kings don't do all the time. 
or David might have refused to speak. <laughs> David might have refused to speak at all, telling the prophet he was going to get a lawyer. David might have claimed amnesia, telling Nathan, "I look at a lot of women from the rooftop. I don't recall that particular one." Or David might have replied, "Well, I didn't do anything illegal." How many times have we heard that one from our leaders? But David was not a weasel. <laughs> He did not make excuses or threaten Nathan or blame someone else. Unfortunately, now the king could not undo what he had done. But David did what he could do, which was to acknowledge his sin, repent, and pray for God's forgiveness. David's humility and repentance, more than anything, is what made him a man after God's own heart. Humility and repentance are part of our journey as Christians, especially during Lent. Our humility and repentance meet the faithfulness of Christ, and divine forgiveness flows to us through the cross. You and I have been given God's own heart as a gift through Christ. <laughs> That is good news indeed. I am going to close by praying some of the verses from Psalm 51, which the Bible tells us David wrote as he repented. Let us pray. Have mercy on us, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out our transgressions. Wash us thoroughly from our iniquities and cleanse us from our sins. Create in us clean hearts, O God, and put new and right spirits within us. Restore to us the joy of your salvation and sustain in us willing spirits. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Receive now this blessing. May the God of love hold you close, forgive you, comfort you, strengthen you to do good, and give you peace. Amen.